Welcome to the MUT Public Lecture on Transformational Leadership. In 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. This public lecture comes at the back of an announcement by the World Health Organization designating this year the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife in recognition of their contribution in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. During this coronavirus pandemic, there have been many stories of how nurses selflessly put their lives on the line to save their patients. As some of you might know, I also come from a nursing background. I was a nurse in my past life and my previous life, if I may say. As you all know, once a nurse, always a nurse. I did my uh, general nursing at King Edward, which was a very, and it's still a very reputable uh, nursing college, if I may still call it that way. I did my midwifery at King Edward, and then I did my community health nursing at DUT, which is something that I still cherish up to now. For our host, MUT, this lecture is so much about honoring nurses, just as it is about celebrating how nurses had to do things differently to save lives. It is transformational character of this leadership in various settings that we are going to hear about from our speakers today. I will be with you as the facilitator throughout the lecture and as I introduce you to various speakers. We have a diverse group of speakers which is testament to the diversity of lens that we are using to approach this lecture. I will introduce each speaker when it is their turn to share their presentations with us. And let me tell you right now, our keynote speaker is Professor Betty Mubangizi. Before the speakers start, I would like to invite our host, Professor Marcus Ramukhale, the Acting Vice Chancellor and Principal of MUT, to say a few words about this lecture. San Bonani. On behalf of the Council of Mangosuthu University of Technology and on behalf of our Senate and other stakeholders, I welcome you to our virtual public lecture entitled Transformational Leadership in 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. The International Year of the, of the Nurse and the Midwife is a year-long event in 2020 to celebrate the work of nurses and, mid and midwives and to highlight the challenging conditions they often face with a view to advocating for increased investment in the nursing and midwifery profession. We host this virtual public lecture during level two of the lockdown necessitated by the coronavirus pandemic. So far, South Africa has recorded just under 700,000 cases and less than 15,000 deaths, whereas the entire world has over 30 million cases and close to a million deaths. South Africa has made tremendous progress in containing the number of infections. And with numbers of those infected dropping every day, we are now able to get to, a le to level one of the lockdown from Monday, 21 September. We are grateful to our president and cabinet for their decisive leadership and for the effective measures implemented to minimize the spread of the coronavirus in our country. We are also grateful to all South Africans for heeding the call to wear masks, maintain social distancing, and frequently wash their hands. These changes in the way we behave have shown us that outstanding results are possible if we work as a team and remain focused and disciplined. This is what the philosophy of transformational leadership is all about. Our public lecture on transformational leadership in 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, 
is a celebration of how nurses across the entire world have had to do things differently to save lives. 2020 has been a daunting year for the whole world. It is a year when life stood still as various governments throughout the world locked down their countries in order to curtail the spread of COVID-19. 2020 is also a year when humanity's awareness was heightened in respect of the critical role that medical and health professionals play in saving lives. We are therefore immensely pleased to bring this public lecture to you using various digital platforms such as Microsoft Teams, YouTube, and television in order to share with you vital information on how nurses led from the front and thereby inspired others to be innovative so as to save lives. At Mango Sutu University of Technology, we took to heart Minister of Higher Education and Training straight on call to save lives and save the academic year. We therefore put in place measures and awareness campaigns to save lives while at the same time saving the academic year. We are heartened that our efforts have borne fruit, with only three students having tested positive since the return of 66% of our students. Today, our public lecture on transformational leadership in 2020 reinforces our strategic intent as expressed in our 2025 strategy, which is to shape and own the future. One of the pillars of this strategic intent is to advance knowledge and understanding in our communities. We therefore look forward to learning from our speakers during their presentations about various methods they used to educate their stakeholders about COVID-19. We are honored that we have secured such a diverse group of professionals to share their knowledge and expertise with us on this topic. Under the expert facilitation of Dudu Lady D. Koza, the Queen of the Airwaves. It is befitting that Ms. Belinda Leonard kicks off with her presentation on how the COVID-19 pandemic has transformed the way the health sector works. Dr. Ntobizonda uh, Linda will share the important lessons from, COVID, uh, uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic for training future nurses. And our own researcher, Dr. Mariam Amra Jordan, will take us through the difficult journey of finding vaccines against global pandemic. Our keynote speaker, Professor Betty Mubangizi, will consider the implications of transformational leadership for the nurse and the midwife in the context of the urban rural divide. Thank you for joining us in this virtual public lecture. May you be increased by what you will learn today. Let us never stop learning because life nev never stops teaching us. Enjoy the presentations and the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ramakhale, for those words. It's now time to call upon our first speaker. She is Belinda Leonard, who is nursing manager at Netcare Umhlanga. She has just under three decades of experience in the nursing profession. I was asked to please just speak about two challenges that I had to overcome in the leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to speak of two. The first one I'm going to speak about is the screening at the facility, how we had to stop all visitation. We had to stop uh, people coming through the doors. We had to risk assess everybody prior to them entering the facility. So you can understand how people have had freedom coming through a hospital door, nobody stopping, asking questions, and suddenly you've got to assess every single patient coming through the door. You've got to restrict every person entering. We had to let the public become aware that you can't just visit your loved ones whenever you felt like it. We had to manage people's expectations. 
we had to inform the doctors, we had to get buy-in from the public, we had to get buy-in from the doctors. And the only way we could do that is to keep everyone informed, we had to go and educate everybody, we had to show them what all the tools for screening was all about, all the questions, why they were, why they were relevant. We then uh, were very fortunate, Nedcare was always in the forefront of uh, the screening and when any new little symptom or sign of COVID uh, came about, we changed all the screening tools so that we could identify if anyone was a risk to the facility and to the patients within the facility. We risk assessed all of our staff every day when they came to work. Nedcare had uh, all uh, paper screening and were the first people to go digital screening. So patients, uh, prior doctors, the staff members would screen themselves prior to coming to the facility. They would then get their temperatures checked, they'd answer all the questions, and then we would allow them in or we'd refer them, escalate them onto a, a centre where we would then risk assess further to identify if they should be swabbed or turned away from the facility. So that was one of the first big concerns and uh, areas that we had to work on. We were very fortunate that we did get buy-in from everyone and were successful in screening and mitigating all risk into the facility. The second big challenge was just preparing our staff, motivating them and allaying their fears. You can understand one minute you are going along living your life and the next thing the pandemic has overtaken your own life and all you're doing is working and breathing COVID. So as a leader, I had to go and do some research and try and find out what was the best way that I could lead my team through this pandemic and the challenges and to help them overcome. And I found um, a lovely uh, author, John Quelsh, and he spoke about the seven C's. And I started always referring to these seven C's throughout my time in leadership at Ned Schlanger. The first one was uh, to remain calm. It's very difficult for your team to follow you when you are not calm and believing in yourself. So the calmness was something I had to try and create throughout the pandemic. The second thing was confidence. It's very important that your team know that you know what you're doing. And sometimes you don't, but you go and you find the solutions. Learning agility was the key to getting through this pandemic. The, probably one of the most important things was communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. You can't reiterate that enough. COVID-19 was a new pandemic and every day there was something new and something that we didn't know and so we changed a lot of processes and procedures in order to mitigate risk further. Collaboration. We had to remember the community, the doctors, the staff, the patients, we all had to collaborate together to try and make sure that we could all get through the pandemic with the least destruction to anybody. Involving the community was very important, um, just communicating to them, making sure the community understood why we had processes in place. Very, very difficult when someone came to hospital, the li their loved ones weren't able to come into the facility. That was very challenging for everybody and we had to try and reassure them. Compassion was another big part. Compassion, you cannot just lead without having empathy and compassion for everybody. So we had to display that constantly. Being a, a business, we had to also remember at the end of the day that cash, the last C, was very important. You have to try and navigate through all of this with remembering it's a business at the end of the day. So looking after everything in the best that you could. And lastly, being a role model was crucial because you cannot get through just expecting to not lead by example. There were days when I made sure that I was there every morning, probably in the six months, there were 10 days I wasn't there to greet my staff every single morning at five, half past five, steering them, preparing them ready for the war. Leadership is taking people on a journey with you. Rely on your processes, be tough, but be human. Flexibility is essential. Be visible and be courageous. Thank you. 
Our next speaker, Dr. Domzo Dolinda, who is a lecturer at the University of Zululand, which used to be called Ongoye when I was still doing my uh, degree there. Uh, she's coming from the Department of Nursing Science. What, what's so funny and very interesting about her is we used to be together at King Edward. Uh, I'm an alumni of Ongoye. I'm alumni of University of Stellenbosch, but I remember vividly our times at King Edward. In pursuit for future nursing education to maintain a solid foundation for healthcare delivery, nurses should form a unified front and joint venture between all the three tripartite partnership, which are nursing education, nursing practice, and nursing research. Whilst going forward, there is a need for this a, a, a joint venture. Acknowledging the new normal of doing things due to COVID-19 prevalence, which is today, maybe tomorrow, we don't know about the future. Formally, they need to integrate subject matter of COVID-19 through competency-based curricula using innovative teaching and learning strategies and approaches such as problem-based learning, service um, learning, community engagement, and collaborative learning. In conclusion, I salute the nurses for their contribution in caring for the sick and contributing to the flattening of the curve. They have made a significant contribution to transformational leadership by demonstrating that the principles they had learned were indeed valuable and effective. They were taught to transform the societies and accept the new normal. We are paying a tribute to all the nurses and healthcare workers who gave their lives for the fellow South Africans by remaining at work despite their own fears and possibly illness and death. Also, may the souls of all those nurses who succumbed to COVID-19 rest in a well-deserved peace because they died in the battle of their own choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linda. I particularly enjoyed your take on the role of nursing education in the management of patients with COVID-19 infection. And the next speaker is MUT's award-winning researcher, Dr. Mariam Amra Jordan. I am honored to be part of this esteemed public lecture hosted by Mangasutu University of Technology. Africa is already burdened with disease with over 69% of the global um, HIV infections. Almost 40 years later, and billions of dollars in global investment, there is still no vaccine. The development of a vaccine is a complex and time-consuming process, and the journey varies from the development of conventional medicines. Generally, the period of development of a vaccine is approximately 12 to 15 years. Conventional medicines are normally used to treat disease from the onset of infection. However, vaccines are meant to induce viral immunity. Nonetheless, the global effort in the fight against HIV has made the response to COVID-19 easier as scientists have gained an incremental amount of information about the immune system and vaccine technologies can now be repurposed against the coronavirus, creating a worldwide infrastructure of clinical trial networks that can be diverted from HIV to the SARS-CoV virus. Although clinical trials are underway, a recent vaccine trial known as the Oxford trial being run in the UK, the United States, South Africa, and Brazil was forced to stop after a participant fell ill and the study has been halted while investigations are underway. A more focused approach is therefore required to reduce the impact of COVID-19 disease. The repurposing of existing drugs designed for, designed for other diseases is the most practical strategy to treat patients with COVID-19 because they have already been tested for their safety. Although de novo de development of antivirals is a time-consuming, cost and effort-intensive endeavor, it is important to generate specific antivirals for SARS-CoV-2 that directly target the viral or host proviral factors with the increasing structural data of key proteins in both SARS-CoV-2 and the host. The structure-based design of new drugs is the most promising antiviral strategy. I always had an interest in 
intestinal chemistry and started my career in research developing novel internal standards for the anti-cancer drug picolutamide, which is used to treat prostate cancer. But the HIV pandemic concerned me so much that I had to do something to assist, as I had seen firsthand the anguish it causes, the orphans it leaves behind, the stigma and the judgment faced by those infected by the disease, as well as the paralyzing fear that this disease instills due to its very existence. The current COVID-19 disease exhibits the same brutality, and I extended our experience in antiretroviral therapy as our research was based on the photochemistry of ARV drug therapy, as HIV itself causes photosensitivity, which is an immune, res immune system reaction that is triggered by light, as most patients are sensitive to UV light. Our research uncovered photoreactions caused by ARV therapy in our plight to develop improved medication. We furthermore realized the importance of computer-aided drug discovery, or CAD. These methods are used to combat difficult to treat diseases and apply the drug repurposing strategy of pre-existing agents to identify FDA approved drugs as potential inhibitors of, of SARS-CoV-2. CAD is becoming an increasingly popular research strategy as the average cost of the de novo drug development reportedly over $1 billion and takes 10 to 17 years. The typical role of CAD is in drug dis discovery is to screen out large compound libraries into smaller clusters of predictive active compounds with a clinically proven safety profile. Virtual screening provided a rapid and inexpensive method for the discovery of FDA approved active compounds exhibiting a scaffold similar to the ARV effavorange, which binds to the active pocket of the COVID-19 main protease. Previous studies has demonstrated that the main protease of SARS-CoV is essential for the life cycle of the virus and considered to be an attractive target for drug development. Virtual screening and molecular docking results revealed promising potential hit compounds for COVID-19 main protease inhibition. The most promising drug hits were levastatin and simvastatin. Statins are inexpensive, cholesterol-lowering genetic drugs that have a favorable safety profile. They, there are documented studies highlighting the antiviral effects on infectious Ebola virus production. Additionally, statins have anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, and immun immunomodulatory effects. Since inflammation, dysregulation of the immune system, and blood coagulation are characteristic features of COVID disease, statins could be then explored as part of, of COVID-19 therapeutics. Statins have also been widely reported to block in infection of many enveloped viruses by inhibiting the cholesterol isoprenoid pathway. So um, the greatest legacy anyone can leave behind is to positively impact the lives of others. Whenever you add value to other people's lives, you are unknowingly leaving footprints on the sands of time that live on even after your demise. My favorite quote, a quote from Emma Sieber George. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. Yours is a difficult task of trying to find vaccines to pandemics. We know that one day, one day, through the work of dedicated researchers such as yourself, a vaccine will be discovered. San Monani Umangobokosa performing to you my song, my single called Ezizwe.
Professor Mbangizi is a full professor of public administration and governance and an NRF rated researcher. She holds the NRF Research Chair in Sustainable Rural Livelihoods at UKZN, that is University of KwaZulu-Natal, School of Management, IT and Governance, where she previously served as a Dean and Head of School. Prior to that, Professor Mbangizi was the Dean of Teaching and Learning in the College of Law. She also served as the Interim Dean of School of Built Environment and Development Studies in the College of Humanities of the same university. The title of her address is The Nurse and the Midwife in the Context of Rural Urban Divide Implication for Transformational Leadership. Greetings to the viewers at home. In recognizing the International Year of the Nurse, I would like from the outset to recognize the selflessness that nurses and healthcare workers have shown the world and concurrently, I pay special tribute to the nurses and midwives whose lives have been lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to thank Mangosutu University of Technology for giving us this platform where we recognize and reflect on the important profession of the nurse and the midwife. I'm not a healthcare practitioner myself, but a professor of public administration and governance I also hold the NRF Research Chair in Sustainable Rural Livelihoods and that is the context in which I'm going to couch my presentation. I will start off by providing the context of a typical rural area in South Africa and proceed to show how that context impacts the lives and nurses of midwives who work in rural areas. I will then conclude by highlighting the critical issues that ought to be considered from a transformational leadership perspective so as to enable a functional environment for the rural nurse and midwife. The basis of my presentation is that a happy and comfortable nurse and midwife is more likely to provide satisfactory health care. And that is the ideal to which we should strive for in this international year of the nurse and midwife. So what is the rule of context in which this healthcare works? There's no single universal definition of rurality. Governments, departments within governments, research institutions, and development agencies all approach the definition of rural and rurality in different ways. How they choose to define rural depends on what the purpose will serve. It's in its most basic form, rural has been defined as everything that is not urban. When defining rural for a particular purpose, as in rural health, there is a number, there are a number of factors that could be included in the definition and understanding of rural and rurality. The first is the population density. Rural populations tend to have lower densities than urban populations and are often more dispersed across vast areas. The economic activity is yet another factor. In rural areas, land is used for farms, mines, and subsistence farming. And here, it is important to make a distinction between commercial freehold land and communal land, usually under the traditional authorities. Settlement patterns is yet another. In rural settlements, you tend to have small towns, villages, and dispersed homesteads. Access to services is yet another factor because in rural communities globally you tend to have less access to basic services such as healthcare, education, water and sanitation. Another aspect of rurality is that um, within rural areas democratically elected local government institutions tend to function alongside the traditional authority, such that you kind of have a form of hybrid governance and a parallel system. Areas that include large settlements in former homelands of South Africa, which depend on migratory labor and remittances, as well as government social grants for their survival, are typically have traditional land tenure systems 
are yet another way of defining rural areas. However way we define reality, it's important to realize that they are home to 33 of South Africa, 33 percent of South Africa's population. And this figure is projected to fall to 30 by 2030. Generally, rural areas account for about 80 percent of the country's land. And they are an important demographically, economically, and politically in rural South Africa. Post-1994, South Africa's government has had imperative and impressive achievements, but poverty, inequality, and unemployment remain the main rural challenge, and the majority of the poor in South Africa live in rural areas. Now, what then are the needs of the nurse and the midwife operating in such a setting? By their very nature, rural areas have a range of infrastructural deficits and this impact on the life of a nurse and a midwife. Transport infrastructure, for example, in rural areas, the roads, the bridges and footpaths that rural residents and healthcare workers have to traverse are often not in an ideal state. Housing infrastructure is yet another deficit. There is inadequate nursing accommodation at rural clinics. And the condition of houses in surrounding communities is generally below optimum. Water and sanitation is yet another infrastructural challenge. Many rural municipalities have huge backlogs in the provision of water and sanitation and a significant number of rural communities still draw water from springs and boreholes. Safety and security is yet another issue of concern because rural communities are considered soft targets by criminals. And this is due to the remoteness of farms, large distances between farms and villages, and the inaccessibility to policing because rural police stations are often isolated and responsible for policing vast areas. Lastly, social cultural infrastructure is quite problematic. Issues of libraries, entertainment, information, communication, broadband, etc., are all on the low side in a rural area. A deficit in any of these areas not only influences the care for patients, but also influences the motivation the performance and the well-being of the nurse and midwife and that of their families and that should concern us. Of course, there are benefits that come with working in rural areas. One might point out that rural areas are quieter, the air is considerably cleaner and professionally it is easy for the nurse to establish close linkages with the nearby communities so that case management extends to beyond the healthcare facility, and that brings some level of satisfaction, no doubt. But it is imperative to improve the living conditions of nurses and midwives in rural areas. And what would this take? I will, from a public governance perspective, point out three strategic areas. The first one is collaboration between different government departments. Being traversal issues, a multi-departmental approach is vital if we are to improve the social economic conditions of the rural populace. Close collaboration between various departments is vital. It is not only a matter for the Department of Health because infrastructure deficits that I've pointed out go beyond the mandate of the Department of Health. We need collaboration between a range of other departments. The Department of Transport, for example, the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, the Department of Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs, the Department of Public Works. All these play a vital role and it's important that there's collaboration. Secondly, we need collaboration between different spheres of government. Poorly resourced municipalities and provinces are least likely to respond to the challenges faced by the nurse and midwife in rural areas. The fiscal and structural challenges 
faced by rural-based municipalities, particularly their weak revenue base. All this impedes their capacity to spend on important programs of housing, of water and sanitation. For rural provinces, with their weak economic base and high levels of poverty, the largest share of funding comes from intergovernmental transfers, which comprise the provincial equitable share and conditional grants. In many rural-based municipalities, state failures like lack of capacities and maladministration prevent development. So intergovernmental fiscal relations and oversights and such instruments are key to improving the economic well-being in rural areas, leading to higher growth and reduced poverty levels. And this requires strong collaborative arrangements and intergovernmental relations between the three spheres of government. Lastly, we need collaborations between the state and non-state actors. Public-private partnerships have long been known to assist where the state is not able to go it alone. The community policing strategy, for example, enhances community police and encourages partnerships in the fight against crime through multidisciplinary collaborations, which focuses on, um, among others, building community resilience to crime. This requires collaboration between rural and farming communities, civil society, traditional leaders, private sector, and various government departments. So what kind of transformational leadership is then required? Um, and to end this presentation, I'm going to look at um, the specific aspects of transformational leadership that is required from a public sector perspective. Transformational leadership has potential to creating a positive work environment that supports nurses and midwives in rural areas. As we have seen, creating a positive environment for nurses and midwives in rural areas draws on a multiplicity of actors and collaboration and partnerships are vital. An important basic principle in creating efficient and effective collaborations and partnerships is leadership and specifically transformational leadership. Transformational leadership requires insightful leaders who understand the status quo, that is, the rural areas are distinctly different, an insightful leader that is able to solicit new ideas and stimulate creative ways of responding to the status quo. Secondly, we need empowered leaders who are able to empower their teams to a situation of shared values and goals, of equality, of consensus, and participatory decision-making. Lastly, we need involved and present leaders, leaders that can inspire, that are committed, egalitarian, and grounded in the firm belief that everyone is equal and should be justly and ethically treated. It is such leaders that we look at public policies through a rural sensitive lens and think of rural circumstances when developing and implementing policies. This view of rural proofing, if I can call it that, is an approach which public policies and strategic plans ensure that unique context of the needs of rural areas and communities are addressed and budgeted for equitably, and that they take account of rural circumstances and needs. In this way, leaders at all levels will coordinate their activities to create a conducive environment in which the rural nurse and midwife will thrive and function, even in the most remote areas of the country. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Mbangizi. Thank you, all our speakers today. I've taken down a few key points from all the lectures. We heard uh, how a pandemic can force us to transform how we do things to save lives. Leadership is the key in initiating that transformation. performing to you the song called Injela. 